It's speaking with gravity. I'm Kervin. Jewel. Joshua. And I'm Dee. And we are a mental health podcast that speaks on how everything affects everything, especially your mental health. Um, yes, it's, um, I'm a therapist. It's not therapy that we're doing here. We, we're doing a podcast. And uh, we just want to bring y'all information about um, things that affect you, mental health, and so on and so forth. So today we're talking about uh, solution focus. And as we always do, we get into like a, a, a Twitter discussion. And eventually I'm going to get to my, we have a guest here today. Um, but we're going we're gonna to let her introduce herself. Well, you know what, I'll let you go ahead and do it now. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Her name is, you want me to give you a government name or just the name that the kids? Whatever. I mean, whatever. Okay. Like. This is Jewel Norman, uh, who is a school counselor, but I'm going to let her introduce herself. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Jewel Norman. I'm a school counselor in Lawrence District 55, um, elementary school counselor. Um, I've worked in this umbrella, under this guidance umbrella, for about eight years, uh, full time school counselor for two. Um, enjoy my job, love working with the kids. And she's, she's pretty all right, if I must say so myself. But we'll, we'll get cool. back into that at a later date. Um, so we usually do a Twitter discussion, QD hour, and then an episode introduction to kind of give get us into a little flow. Um, and the discussion, I'm going to go, Josh, you go ahead. And, yeah, yeah. And, and so Twitter that. discussion of the day. Research shows that most people complain once a minute while during typical conversation. Shift your mind from a negative <laughs> position of constant complaints to the positive position of solution focused through therapy. That's brought to us by Gravity Counselor, Gravity Counseling Group. Sorry, yeah. on Twitter. Oh uh, yeah, which is uh, my private practice, by the way. Which is Kervin's yeah. private practice, by yeah, the way. Yeah. Um, Speak up a little bit, sir. <laughs> oh my bad, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, research shows that most people complain once a minute, and I, I've saw that like a couple of times. Y'all, y'all I believe it. Yeah. Y'all I believe okay. it. All right. that 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 caught my eye, which is why I put it out there on, on Twitter. Um, but with that being said, that kind of leads into what I I like to call positive psychology. Like let's let's put a spin on. It. Let's not do that. Uh, yeah. And then led me to um, talking about this today solution focused approach. Um, the QD of the hour doing a healthy mind study conducted by a Boston University researcher. Eighty three percent of students report their mental health negatively impact their academic performance within the past month. That's big. Believable, it too. Is. Why do you say it's believable? I think it's believable that we talk about uh, college students. We're talking about college students, right? Boston yeah, and, 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 this, yeah. and this particular one is, is college yeah, students. I mean, yeah, I mean, college, that's when you're going through, you know, uh, you're just coming out of adolescence, or is that adolescence? I mean, you... I mean, you're uh, yeah, becoming yourself, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So going into adulthood. So I feel like so much is coming at you. You know, you, you know, from a mental health standpoint, that's a lot to unpack, right? And then, if you don't have proper resources, I guess to go to, it's definitely going to affect your mental health in a negative way. It's, it, I guess, the number that get me is eighty three percent. So that's eight out of ten people. Eight out of ten people report you know, their mental health negatively impact them. But you know, stress is a major factor in that. You go to college, you get stressed out, and then that negatively impacts your mental health. Um, you don't eat right, you don't sleep, um, and then that leads to not being able to function properly um, as it pertains to academic performance. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I get that. I, I'm just thinking, I keep looking at myself like, I, I'm, I'm not going to say I didn't have any stressors, but my stressors <laughs> were related to me having a good time, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah. Like, um, everybody going to this party, <laughs> and I ain't got $5. <laughs> $5 ain't going to get you into no party. But that, that was my stressor. It wasn't necessarily, and maybe because I wasn't, at that time, trying to make a 3.0 or 3.5. Like, I was good with a C. C's and D's equal degrees. That was my thought process at that time. 
hope my kids don't watch that. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, and I guess that's why I just I was just happy to be there. I was just mm-hmm. happy to be in school and and passing classes and and continuing to get closer to graduation. So I don't know. I guess my outlook was just a little bit different. I was in that too. I was that seventeen percent that was you know what? As long as I'm here, I'm good. All right. So the 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 uh, introduction the episode introduction. Unlike traditional forms of therapy that take time to analyze problems, pathology, and past life events, solution-focused approach concentrates on finding solutions in the present and exploring one's hope for the future in order to find a quick and pragmatic resolution of one's problems. This method takes the approach that you know what you need to do to improve your own life and with the appropriate coaching and questioning are capable of finding the best solutions. This is an excerpt from Psychology Today. Which kind of explains what solution focus is. And, and again, you know, when we're, when we're coming up with these episodes and when we're talking about various things, we want to put it out there so people understand what's going on when it comes down to therapy, what's going on, going on when it comes down to mental health. And I hear different people talk about modalities, you know, what modality are you following? Um, modality being, what way do you deliver therapy? What way do you give it? Um, and there again, with solution focus, I think of school counselors because there's a problem, let's fix it. Not necessarily everything that a mental health counselor would do outside of the school system. So that being said, I reached out to two counselors. One was able to make it. Um, so putting it on you, what school counselors do? <laughs> and when I was in school, we called them guidance, guidance counselors. counselors. Right. So um, right. what, what do they do? And, well, and when you talking now, you're talking to somebody, grandma. <laughs> right, so right, right. By, you know, So, what you know, do? we definitely prefer school counseling now because that guidance um, term more ref- it refers more to like vocational um, development and that's not truly what we focus on now. Uh, I mean, we're in the schools, we're part of the leadership team, making decisions for the entire school. Um, We are implementing positive um, activities and things that's gonna get the kids interested in school, providing a safe space for children to come um, and just have a conversation. My biggest thing every single day when I go into the building is to be a listener. Um, to children and making sure that they understand what school is for them and what their goals are and then, you know, kind of helping them reach those things, obtain those goals. What are you having to listen to? What what are you having to listen to when you say listen to kids? Because you're in the elementary school. Right, right. Are you listening? Well, they don't and do those are the no biggest more. talkers. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, they're not too bashful yet about things that's going on in their life. They don't know to be embarrassed about certain things yet. So they're more resilient in those types of ways because they, they just like want to come and talk and tell you everything, even things that they're not supposed to be telling you. Um, but believe it or not, um, elementary kids, we're talking about um, why you should have impulse control, why you can't go in the room and do what you want to do, behavior management, um, you know, and making them understand that school is a place that you come to learn. Um, but we also want you to have fun and learning, but there's appropriate ways to do that. Um, and I also act as an advocate for students and their parents um, because a lot of times students and families, they need things that, and they don't even know what they need. So I'm that person, that liaison within the school that helps them find those resources. As a parent, um, and y'all can chime in at any point, but when you say I'm, I'm there for them to talk to, as a parent, how can I set that up for my my eight year old, my my fourteen year old, my fifteen year old, like how? And I know what I do, but I, I would just like to hear it from you. Like, how can I talk to them to get them to be able to share things with me? Um, as we may be aware here, we had an incident within our community uh, of an individual who seemed to have reached his, you know, his breaking point to to some degree, um, and he took some. You know, he, he made some moves and some steps that we, we as a society would rather him not do. How do we open that space for him to be able to come? Or how do I open that space for my kids to say, hey, come talk to me 
about X, Y, and Z because I want I want to let you know I'm there to support you. I think the biggest thing parents can do um, is be more transparent with their children. Um, I think, you know, older generations have always tried to say, do as I say, not as I do. You have to let them know that you've been there before and that even though you might not have gone through exactly what they're going through, you can relate um, or you've had a friend in the past that been through something like that. Um, Because a lot of times I think kids think, you know, my, my mom, my dad wouldn't understand. Um, and, and part of that is because they, the parents don't. They try to close it off and they want, they want to hear good things from their kids all the time. They don't make an inviting space for them to be able to talk about the negative things in their life um, without judgment. And that's key. And me, me and one of my friends was talking uh, a little while ago. We said he made the statement and he explained it. Josh, you don't like this one. Being a parent is so hypocritical. Mm. Because, you know, you know what you have done as a parent. <laughs> you know the experience that you put yourself into, and, right. but you're not always willing to share that with your child to, yeah, to let them know, as you, as you said, be, trans- be transparent and let them know where you come from. Um, I was speaking with my daughter the other day about uh, some stuff um, that happened in college. I gave her the story. But I love some of the story out too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> you got to give them a little bit of it now. Is that wisdom? Is that or is that lack of transparency? I think that's, that's an argument. You know, you say you think it's wisdom. Yeah, definitely. You got to use discernment, and you know, in, in what you're telling your kids. You know, be be able to talk to them about everything, but they're on the level. They're not on your level yet. They're not on your level yet. It's easier to see that from an eight-year-old standpoint than it is from a 14, 15-year-old. Because, you know, again, I'm not going to tell you all the story. But the story is, is related to college and her being aware of her surroundings, right? And so, I, you know, again, definitely left out some, some information. But mm-hmm. it's easier to see it when you're, when you're dealing with the eight-year-old. Oh, okay, I shouldn't say this because they're not going to understand this. But, you know, growing up until 14, 15, 16, they can kind of understand a lot. I think you still, I think discernment is one of the things you have to be attentive to. But I think it's also about um, you can be transparent and not disclose everything. Um, you can communicate a story and not provide every single detail of, of an event. It doesn't make the experience any less transparent. Uh, I think when you're talking about transparency, it's when you omit information for fear of judgment towards yourself and you try to yeah mm, yeah well you're talking it. about withholding transparency is because you don't want to be misseen or misheard as something other transparency means that i acknowledge that i didn't make the best decision at that point that's what transparency means it means that i'm not trying to withhold this information because i want to influence your perception i'm allowing you to see that you know what where I am now is not always where I've been, right? Um, and I don't think I think age is is important, but you know, even at fourteen, there are things at fourteen that you don't understand from a college perspective. Because at fourteen, you get told to get up and go to school. At 18, 19, 21 in college, nobody's telling you to get up, right? You have to be able to manage that yourself. And there are a lot of things that my eighteen year old or my fourteen year old self would not have understood what 20-year-old me, a uh, sophomore at Lander, understood. And now things that 20-year-old D understood, 34-year-old D, <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's a whole different level. Like, I really wish I could go back and be 20-year-old D again, me sitting too. in the classroom. Like, if that was the easiest thing me I had too. to get up with, is to get up and go to class, I would do that. Like, if <laughs> right. I could go back... And just chill, you know, going in the room, turning the light on, not seeing a light bill, you know, going to the calf, just food spread everywhere. Taking you know, naps in the middle of the day. Taking naps in the middle of the day. In the middle of the day. I'm complaining because I'm going to sit in a classroom, sit For down at a chill, and write. That's what I'm doing. I'm kill to do that now. Right. right. You know, and, and that's just the experience of it. And I think when, even when we're talking about little kids... It's not about omitting that, but I think sometimes we put so much pressure on, we want our kids to be the next genius sometimes, and I think that's where you have some of this this issue from, because we try to give them too much too soon. Like, 
I remember, I'll never forget a parent telling me, like, I teach my child. She don't got friends. And I was like, well, we don't teach our children that, right? You know what I'm saying? We teach them how to be a, what a friend looks like. You know what I'm saying? And they will choose that. But we can't teach them that nobody's their friend because now we going to have them questioning everybody they see. Eventually, what do you hope to be to them? You know what I'm saying? A part of their friends. You know, parent first, but friend too. It's definitely about balance because if you go that route of, like you say, you don't have friends, now you're not trusting anybody. Right. Uh, or if you go the route of, you know, Make sure you surround yourself with a lot of friends. Now they think they got to have a People bunch of please. friends. Like you, you, mm-hmm. got, you got to have a balance. You guys just can't give them one side of it. Um, so what would you say, like how do students, how should students find you as a school or find any school counselor? Like I, I know you're in the elementary, but I'm pretty sure you, you're aware of both levels, right? The, right. the other levels, middle school and right. high school. How do kids, are, how are they supposed to come at a school counselor? Like if they do have... Issues. I want to. Do they know? Do they? When I say do it, they know, like to be honest, it depends on the school counselor and what they focus on in their job. I like to be in the hallways making myself known. Mm-hmm. You gonna have some school counselors that stay in their office all the time, so kids don't know who they are and they don't know that they can go to that person and talk to them. Um, but myself, I go into classrooms mm-hmm. um, and and see. I ho- I wear so many hats. They know I'm a school counselor, but they also know me as their testing coordinator. Like, I, I wear so many hats where kids just know, okay, that's Miss Norman. I know I can tell her what I need to tell her. And then you got to make sure you're working closely with teachers, too, because then teachers can say, because a lot of times the thing that aggravates me the most is teachers speaking on things with students that they should have referred to me for. Yeah. Um, because then we start to interject our own feelings and thoughts onto children instead of, you know, kind of letting them um, lay it out. We listen and then we're trying to teach them strategies to accomplish or get over what they're doing. You got people spilling into um, children that shouldn't be. Um, Do you feel like you have? Go ahead, man. Do you feel like you have that communication with the teachers, like that they are reaching out to you? Like you? Absolutely. And what I do That's is good. I... Um, I create a, a document where teachers can go in and fill out a form mm-hmm. um, so if they notice a child is not being themselves or if a child comes to them with the issue and the teacher feels like it's something that needs to be um, uncovered behind closed doors, then they would fill out that form and then it immediately comes to me. And when I have time, I go grab that student out of class. So mm-hmm. I try to be very visible. That's dope. That's dope. Yeah, I feel like that constant collaboration is important between the teacher and, the, and those counselors. Right. Like con- consistent, yeah. So with the referrals, the teachers are the one that's doing the referral or the student themselves can can refer? Um, elementary school, mainly teachers, adults in the building, even parents. You know, parents can call the school and say, hey, I need you to talk with my child. Um, but you do have those kids that now they don't have a way to put it in on the computer or send me an email, but they see me in the hall and say, Ms. Norman, can you grab me today? Um and, and normally, I, I try to fit them in. Um, that's how they refer themselves, but mainly it comes from the teacher. Do you ever like observe? My bad, Kerr. I keep interrupting you. Don't know. I think you do it on purpose. But go ahead. Do you ever like observe for yourself, like certain behaviors in children? And, Absolutely. And, and then go to the teacher, like, hey, I like to, mm-hmm. or or do you approach the child? Like, how do you? How do you do that? Um, so I go. I do lessons as well in the classroom. Um, and again, I try to be. I know. I try to know all students by their name and their face. I serve about two hundred and almost eighty kids, um, which is sm- a small amount actually. But um, you know, I try to make sure that those kids know who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and then go from there because I, relationship is key. And so if a teacher has developed a relationship with a child, yeah, they can tell me when they notice things have changed. But if a teacher is, hasn't developed a relationship with that child, um, nine times out of ten, they're just going to ignore those signs. Right, right. Um, so, again, that collaboration piece. Um, and you also have parents that's going to call and say, hey, my child said something that they, you know, spoke on something that they normally wouldn't speak on. Or I had a parent call me and say, you know, my child took through a temp- temper tantrum this morning just to brush their teeth. Can you have a conversation with them? They never do anything like that. And now it might seem small, but there has to be a change in that child for them to act out when they normally wouldn't. And so my job is to pull that child and see what caused that tantrum. What was the antecedent to that behavior? Um, 
And so that's that's my only. How does that conversation start? Like with that child, then like, because because I feel as though. Uh, Cause I think about, dang, if if I'm a child and I'm trusting my parent, you know, to, you know, to to be guiding me and whatnot, then I find out my parent telling my telling on me mm-hmm. <laughs> to the to the school uh, counselor. telling on me. You know what they I'm saying? It. Like, so how do you start that type of conversation with the child? Like, um, honestly, I, I'd be honest. I'm like, you know, your mom was concerned about you. Concerned, okay. Yeah, okay. you know, and you know, sometimes you know when you live in a household with your parent, they don't always know how to approach you about some certain topics and certain behaviors, and so she knows that that's kind of what I do every day. So she kind of wanted me to help you. You know, to going back to your mom's that. concern. That's where it's coming from, right? Yeah, yeah. A concern standpoint. You you said uh, you had about two hundred and eighty something students, right? Mm-hmm. And you said that's a low amount. Yeah, I, so I'm most a, counselors have higher than that. Yes. So, like elementary, um, in our district, all elementary schools only have one school counselor in the building, and I'm the smallest elementary school with two hundred and almost eighty kids. In an ideal situation, what would that Look like and like what I guess would be re- I don't know I don't know if I want to say reasonable but what would it, ideally what should school counselors have what kind of um the ratio should be one to two fifty okay. okay so mine isn't that bad but like you got some larger elementary schools where they're serving five and six hundred kids wow mm-hmm. and is that like a uh, are people not wanting to be school counselors that's why it's so high like. Is that a high turnover for this particular field? Actually, it's not. People get in school counseling, and they stay counselors for years. Um, The biggest thing is the school and the districts aren't hiring those positions. They're not using the funds to have more counselors within the building. Um, So like a school with 600 kids, you know, they should at least have two, maybe three counselors in the building. But school districts aren't providing those positions. So there's no mandate saying if you got got this many per, need this many counselors per child? State, no. Oh, okay. But as Mm. it pertains to like us counselors and our guidelines, it should be one to two fifty. That's like they get by with it. That's like your ethics or something. Right. Okay. Okay. So it's not mandated by the state that you have to have a certain amount. Right. Oh wow, that's interesting. And so then that 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 money then would be dispersed however the district or the is it the district or the school would see fit district because it you know you have to provide that wow opportunity yeah that position that's interesting that's yeah. really I, I didn't know that that's interesting i mm-hmm. guess that's one of the things you could fight for if you're a parent and you're going to school boards we listen to school board meetings mm-hmm. that might be one of the things if that's important to you that we need to ask or mm-hmm. or see about when when we are Voting for people for a school um, for the school board, or, or if we even go into those meetings, mm-hmm. I agree. Um, did you have something, Josh? You, you I had a some, question. But I'm gonna uh, let you ask yours first because I'm gonna beat you to the punch. Huh? Nah, go ahead, man. You, I, yeah. I was gonna ask. That, so that uh, solution focused approach uh, was, was uh, as I was looking at the notes. That was really, you know, just really interesting me. So I'm I'm interested in how does that look dealing with uh, elementary school children? That solution focused approach for you as a School counselor, or, or do you even use that approach? Um, I take yeah, bits and I'm pieces for, yeah. from a lot of different things. I got like a congruent of things going on, um, but solution folks mainly brief. You know, I don't provide ongoing counseling to students. I, not only do I not have time, but that's not what I'm specialized in. Um, so a lot of things I'm doing crisis management. Mm. That's brief. Um, conflict resolution, but it's brief. Um, Versus a mental health counselor, um, there they can be brief as well. How, however, theirs is more individualized because you know who you gonna see. But I don't know who might come to my office that day with a crisis or a conflict. So I have to be brief in my counseling, and so when, that's where that solution focus piece comes in. Um, not so much as looking ahead, let's focus on what we got going on right now and what strategies can we use right now to fix your issue that you're dealing with right, right now. now. I got you. How, how I can get you back to class today. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> understood, understood. Yeah. I understand. It's, it's, it's different than how you, how you would assess something in your role. I understand. So um, what are some of the, the heavier problems that 
I'm not going to say you deal with it because I don't want to pinpoint your school. But, like, mm. if, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, you just went through, like, a training or something, like, a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, what are things that, I guess, school counselors are focused on? What problems? No, not what they focus on. What problems do they see in schools when it comes down to kids? Um, suicide. Mm. Um, elementary. Um, wow. So, you know, and, and bullying. Th- those are the two top things right now in, in which people think bullying leads to that suicide piece. Um, but the, the misunderstanding is parents call about bullying and saying that they don't want their child to be bullied because now they're having suicidal thoughts. It's not bullying because they, they got to understand the definition of bullying. Which uh, you want to give it to us? Bullying is when someone is harassing you repeated, repeatedly. You know, it's not, oh, they call me a name today. They're bullying me. Or, you know, they push me out my chair today. That's not bullying me. Now, if they come in and do it every single day, now that's bullying. And we don't really see bullying. So it's at home, that conversation that those parents at home, making them children feel like they're being bullied in school, um, and then which leads to negative thoughts um, about themselves. And so, you know, it's, it's all about that communication piece. Let's talk about what, what all that really means. Is there a way for school counselors to have, I guess, trainings with parents? Absolutely. I mean, I mean that's that's part of our job, but it's just hard sometimes to get fit that in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I will say we do simple things like sending out flyers, monthly brochures, and things, and, and making sure that we are available to parents, letting them know our contact information. Um, but yeah, we should be hold, holding parent nights where we um, provide different resources and information to parents on how to deal with their children at home. So, absolutely. So parents can come to you like like Ab- the kids could. Absolutely. And say, hey, I need help with parenting, or I need help doing this. They can come. They can stop you and say, Hey, can you help me with this? Um, they can, but they won't see me for that. I have someone within the district that's a parent coach so you that I can refer them to. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it's almost like you, in addition to bringing awareness and education, you can um, resource out or you can refer them to somebody, right. provide resources for them to right. address whatever they got going on. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, anybody, did y'all have anything else? Because you covered a lot in a short span of time. And I, um, I don't think I got nothing. Did anybody have anything? Josh, you got something that you looking up over there that uh, you want to share with everybody? I was just looking. No, no I, think, I think it's been good. I, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You sure? Yeah. Because you've been cutting me we'll, off. We'll have her back on again, if, if so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Jewel, um, what's, what would be something you would give to parents when it, I guess from, from your standpoint being – you being in the, in the school and you seeing the school from your area, from your side of it, what would you give parents, what would you encourage parents to do, say, look for, what would be your advice to parents, your closing advice to parents in general? Um, open dialogue with their children. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter how com- uncomfortable the conversation may be, some things need to be talked about. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, Parents a lot of times shy away from those things, but those are the things that I think parents sometimes has a, have a false sense of what's really going on behind those school doors. Um, kids are exposed to many different things because you have so many kids coming from so many different backgrounds that's introducing your child to things that you are completely oblivious about. So the things that you see on social media, the things that you see on TV, really you need to be having that conversation with your child about it. Um, because nine times out of ten, they already know. They've already been introduced to it. So I just think open dialogue, communication, all of that. Do I want to say, um, I think that's um, a reason that, that parent training or something somebody said is, uh, would be really beneficial. Because I, got some, I know some people, I'm scared of their children going to them. Yeah, because yeah. they're not providing that safe space. Yeah, because they won't provide the safe space, exactly. Um, their experiences, things that they've gone through, I, I, and maybe how they were brought up. I'm, I'm just kind of fearful about if that child is going to feel confident, really exposed, and, and and exactly what they, how they're going to convey that to that child. 
Um, it can be kind what, of scary. What their response is going, what the parents' response, what their is response gonna is going to okay. be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, like we talked about some advice. I think somebody mentioned earlier some advice. It might have been last episode. I don't know that um, that a parent had gave their child. You said something D earlier. Well, um, but going going back to that open dialogue, and I don't. It's a heavy topic, and we had a whole episode on suicide, right? So when you you said um, two of the things is bullying and suicide, and then mm-hmm. you're also saying have open dialogue. Mm-hmm. How can we have open dialogue about suicide? And I, I'm not going to put all the pressure on you, but I would like for all of us to kind of chime in on this. Um, and for me, I'm trying, first of all, I'm trying to think, have I had, the conversation. I don't think I don't know if I had the conversation with my kids verbatim about it, like suicide. I'm not sure, but if if I'm gonna have that discussion, uh, I'm just gonna come with it. You know, all right, we're gonna talk about this today. What do you think about it? What are your thoughts? What have you seen? Um, you know, and some now a lot of times in the past, I, again, I don't think it's, it's it's directly dealing with suicide, but I have watched shows with them. That have addressed certain issues. So now, after we watch the show, that's now right. let's dialogue that's, about that's it. That's right? a very good way to um, get in there. Yeah, but um, and there was a there was a one on suicide not too long ago. I think it's uh thirteen reasons mm-hmm. something. Yep. I can't remember the, the whole reasons. title. Yeah, thirteen reasons why. Um, that that would be possibly a way to, to kind of get in there. But um, uh, what do y'all think? What's a way to have that open dialogue about suicide? I think what you just said is a great way. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, in, watching something, a show, um, or you, you see something on social media talking about suicide, and you ask, have you heard about this? And believe it or not, a lot of times how I'm alerted to another child having suicidal thoughts is from a friend. Because, mm-hmm. see, they already told their friend. So parents asking, not just saying, how was your day? How was your day? What did you and your friends talk about today? Mm. You know what I mean? So you got to dig a little deeper. Yeah, you got to be uh, specific mm-hmm. to kind of get at that. Go through mm-hmm. that phone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See what's going on. All right. Um, all right. So thank you, Jewel, for coming out and um, being with us and, and, and enlightening us from um, your standpoint on um, counseling, so solution focus, and the stuff that uh, kids are dealing with uh, in these schools. Did you have any parting statements that you want to share with us besides how the great working relationship that you and I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I appreciate you guys for having me. Um, I think it is um, an awesome way to get the dialogue started. You know, we come here, we bring it here, and now we got parents and people watching saying, okay, I think I need to go try that with my child. Um, and so, you know, that's one way to get the information out there is by having conversations like this because we, we're talking about things that some people aren't even thinking about. Yeah. So appreciate you for coming out and thank everybody um, for listening to us for um, more uh, questions and thought provoking material uh, about life, health, family, culture, so on and so forth. Visit Let's Talk About It on YouTube, hosted by none other than Mr. Joshua Williams. Subscribe. It's Joshua Garvey Williams. There it is. Subscribe. <laughs> on all platforms, right? Yeah, subscribe on YouTube, but yeah. definitely check it out on all platforms. Um, and do do the same for us. Speaking with gravity, um, we'll we'll put it in the show notes. And um, for your event needs, please see six one event rentals. What is six one event rentals? All right. Well, if you don't know, you need to call them call so me. that you can just spice up your uh, event or take it to uh, another level. Okay. And reach out to Kodak Ready. Tell them what mm-hmm. y'all. Tell them what you do over there at Kodak Ready. Just, just real quick, real quick. Thirty seconds. Um, so Kodak Ready is a consultant services that seeks to help people professionally, personally, um, as well as um, dealing with some stress and grief. Um, I am a strategist and solution focused approach. So yeah. So. We just talked about, even though she wouldn't say nothing, we did talk about solution focus. So if you got these crisis um, in, um, situations, problems, solution focus, you need to see her. Um, and then you know, y'all can strategize on how to reach your goal or, or solve the problem. 
Uh, shout out to Mr. Winston for holding us down on the audio and the visual productions. Check him out on WinstonJStewart.com. And thank you all for taking the time to listen to us. You could be doing anything in the world, but you chose to listen to us or watch us on YouTube, and we appreciate that. I am a therapist, but this isn't therapy. It's the podcast. <laughs>